Hi, my name is Gerald Zernig. I'm a pharmacologist, neuroscientist, and psychotherapist, and I'm going to introduce you to the neural networks that are shared by motivated behavior and addiction. Why does a dependent syndrome feel like passionate love? Let us look to the diagnostic guidelines, the diagnostic criteria for dependent syndrome, and the uh, dependent syndrome is meant a dependent syndrome for drugs of abuse or a substance issued by the World Health Organization, WHO, in their International Classification of Diseases, 10th Revision, a compendium of diagnosis. And the WHO says that a definite diagnosis of dependence should usually be made only if three or more of the following six criteria or symptoms have been present together at the same time during the previous year. And those six are a strong desire or sense of compulsion to take the substance. Another term for this would be craving. I crave this, I crave that. Difficulties in controlling substance taking behavior in terms of its onset, termination of levels, uh, levels of use, which means that I have to get it. I can't stop doing this. I can't stop taking it. The third criterion would be a withdrawal state. And there would be evidence of tolerance to parts of the same phenomenon. This means that if I do not have it, if I do not possess, if I do not consume the drug of abuse, um, I uh, have a certain, I experience certain emotions that may be intensely negative. And tolerance means uh, that in order to obtain the same effect, I have to take more and more of the substance, or if I have only the same amount of substance all the time, I get less and less out of it. I feel much less. Both, uh, both uh, aspects uh, of dependence being the expression of the same molecular phenomena. For me, this, the fifth criterion is the core criterion of dependence, a single symptom to describe dependence the progressive neglect of alternative pleasures or interests. All my motivation, all my interest, all my drive is channeled toward one stimulus, be that a drug of abuse or the beloved person or a non-drug stimulus uh, at the cost of excluding and neglecting everything else. Everything else becomes meaningless, shallow, bland, uninteresting. My whole drive, motivated behavior, is directed toward the stimulus that I am dependent on. The sixth criterion would be to persist with the substance use despite clear evidence of overtly harmful consequences for the individual. Not in general terms, but for example, depressive mood states consequent to periods of heavy substance use. Three or more of these criterions have to be fulfilled simultaneously in the observation period uh, of the past year in order to fulfill the criteria uh, of a dependence syndrome for a diagnosis of dependence syndrome to be put forward. I have uh, brought with me the um, passionate love scale, a psychometric instrument developed in 1986 and published that and the uh, yes or no questions are the following. Since I've been involved with the person, uh, the object of my passionate love, my emotions have been on a roller coaster, which is typical for human dependence. It's not only a blissful state, but it's an oscillation between positive moods brought by the consumption of the substance of abuse, the drug of abuse, 
and withdrawal states, uh, which may be very, very aversive, um, associated with negative emotion and lead to an intense craving for the drug of abuse. I would feel deep despair if the person I love left me or if I would not have access to the drug of abuse anymore. So you see the similarities and the parallels. Sometimes I feel I can't control my thoughts. They are obsessively on the person I love or the drug of abuse. Again, neglect of all alternatives, the whole life behavior, the motivated behavior, the intentions all focus on the object of love, on the object of the dependent syndrome, on the drug of abuse. You see the parallels? I would rather be with cocaine than anyone else. If I were separated from, for a long time, I would feel intensely lonely. This captures the uh, internal state of a drug dependent person as well as of a person dependent on another person or any object uh, that the uh, individual is dependent on. An existence without would be dark and dismal. I get extremely depressed when things don't go right in my relationship with that person. And this passionate love scale was used by um, a research group to investigate which brain regions are activated during early stages of romantic love and later stages. And these uh, researchers, Aaron and co-workers, first made a survey of published data on brain regions that uh, had been studied regarding reward or romantic love here shown in this table one, table one lists them. The VTA, the ventral tegmental area, the SN, the substantia nigra. We will come back to these brain regions again and again so that you get a, a, a repair, a, so that you get a good feeling about their location. The caudate head, the caudate head and body, the putamen, a very important region here, the accumbens, also called the ventral stratum, the amygdala, and other brain regions that we will talk about. And here is the brain region that was activated, that lit up um, when, a, um, when the subject looked at a picture of a beloved person versus a person that was known to them but was not the object of their desire and the object of their love. And here you can see the correlation between the passionate love scale score on the x-axis and the response, the activation of the brain region on the y-axis. And you can see that there is a correlation. The more the subject felt passionate love for that person that was depicted on the image, the more the caught it lit up, was activated. In comparison, what does intravenous morphine feel like? In, an, in a landmark study by Abraham Wickler in 1952, uh, a subject was allowed to um, sample morphine, have injections of morphine, intravenous morphine, every time he desired. And this is indicated here. He asked for and received 30 milligrams of morphine intravenous, I'm sorry, intravenously. Immediately after injection, his skin was flushed. He rubbed his nose and appeared very happy. The flush subsided in a few seconds. On interrogation, he said the sensation was comparable to sexual orgasm, a description that um, drug-dependent individuals, drug addicts, Intravenous drug abusers, technical term for that would be junkie, also describe if they want to uh, convey what, uh, what taking a drug feels like to an individual who is not experienced with drugs. It feels 
like a sexual orgasm, but the drug addicts would add only much, much, much better and much longer. This lasted only a few seconds and was followed by a feeling as if he had had one or two drinks of whiskey. However, he preferred morphine to whiskey and he gives the reasons why. So this is what intravenous morphine feels like. This is what intravenous cocaine feels like to experienced users. And those uh, experienced users were administered 0.6 milligram per kilogram cocaine over 30 seconds, which is a rather long period of time. Here, this arrow marks the um, time of infusion. It was administered in double-blind fashion, so neither the uh, researcher nor the subject knew if it was saline or cocaine. And first focus on the positive effects of the cocaine injection, high and rush, and you see that it peaks at about eight minutes and then declines. And please notice also that this injection of cocaine is followed pretty soon, 15 minutes, by an increase in negative emotions, such as feeling low and having a craving for cocaine. So you can see that 15 minutes after an intravenous injection of cocaine, the individual experiences an intense desire to have the next cocaine shot again. And this, again, is the core, the essential, uh, of the essential emotional state, what dependence feels like, an oscillation, an intense oscillation between two states, bliss, happiness, fulfillment, and an intense desire to take the drug again. So an intense desire is a um, subjective report of a high motivation, of a high motivational state to obtain something. So in that sense, drugs of abuse, the desire and the behavior leading to uh, drug consumption is a very, very good model of motivated behavior that drives our everyday behavior for goals, for rewards that are not as intense as drugs of abuse. Which region was activated during the uh, intravenous cocaine infusion? And you can see here again, this is a coronal section of the brain, like this, and in the middle of the brain um, and at the, at the ventral side, you see that the nucleus accumbens is activated during the intravenous cocaine infusion. You also see other brain regions that have been uh, found again and again to contribute to drug addiction and motivated behavior, the amygdala, the seed of our emotional memory, the globus pallidum, the globus pallidus, uh, the projection area of the nucleus accumbens, and the ventral tegmental area, the origin of the dopaminergic projections to the nucleus accumbens and also a, a region that is very adjacent to the, uh, to the ventral tegmental area, the substantia nigra. This image shows you which brain areas light up when an individual thinks about the expected value of monetary rewards. When those individuals thought of money they were going to get, their brain slid up in a brain region called the medial prefrontal cortex, an area that inputs into the nucleus accumbens, the nucleus accumbens itself, and the ventral tegmental area, the origin of dopaminergic projections to the nucleus accumbens. So what you can see here is that the nucleus accumbens, this brain region, is a very hot zone with respect to motivated behavior and addiction. We could also contribute to that, and we could show that uh, in an area that we call the accumbens corridor, here would be the anterior commissia, the accumbens core, and going, to the, going medially to the interhemispheric sulcus, the medial accumbens shell, the major island of Calechia, the vertical limb of the diagonal band, the medial septum, the lateral septum, 
all of these regions are activated when an individual, in our case, in this case a rat, is in an environment, in a context in which it had previously experienced a cocaine injection. And this context uh, elicits a very strong activation in all these areas of the accumbens that we call accumbens corridor. Uh, we also went on to show, as others did, that um, the major neuron type in this era that was involved in this response are dopamine D1 receptor expression medium spiny neurons in the whole accumbens corridor. Here you have again the medial shell of the accumbens and the medial core of the accumbens. Um, much more so than dopamine D2 receptor expressing medium spiny neurons. So, the take home message is the neural networks mediating motivation, motivated behavior, goal directed behavior, reward, which is the goal of motivated behavior, this is where we want to get to, where, uh, which we want to obtain, and dependent syndromes, which is an suboptimal drive towards one goal at the cost of pursuing other goals, a channeling of behavior towards one single goal, which is pathological, the prime therapeutic targets with respect to the brain region would be the nucleus accumbens, and 95% of the neurons in this area are dopamine, again, are dopamine receptor expressing medium spiny neurons, and it seems that D1 medium spiny neurons are more involved than D2 medium spiny neurons or fulfill differential roles, as we will see in the second part of my talk. The nucleus accumbens, of course, is not the only brain region mediating reward, motivated behavior, drug addiction, passionate love, dependence syndromes. The so-called reward pathways, which is a commonly used term that I personally do not like, um, are depicted here in a lay media representation. And here you can see uh, a brain. This would be the front of a person, though here would be the eyes. Here's the cerebellum. This is the occiput. This is the brain stem. And it should only illustrate to you again where approximately these brain regions lie. To repeat, this is the ventral tegmental area. Dopaminergic projections to the accumbens, which can be subdivided in the core and the shell. And here we have the prelimbic and infralimbic cortex, also called medial prefrontal cortex, and the cingulate area one and two also brain regions contributing to drug reward, dependent syndrome, motivated behavior. Uh, this is uh, a more realistic depiction of which brain areas are involved. Again, you can see here the ventral stratum, the nucleus accumbens, inputting regions and outputting regions, and the redder the area, the more the um, brain regions are about emotionally loaded goal-oriented behavior about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The hotter the area, the more it's emotionally loaded. And as you can see, passionate love and drug dependence is a behavior and a state or states that are accompanied by very, very intense emotions. This is um, a summary of the so-called reward pathways that to me seems much more realistic. You can see here where this brain slice is coronal sections were taken from. This is a red head, the uh, snout, the ears, the whiskers. This would be the olfactory region of the rat, and here would be the uh, cerebellum, and here the brain stem. So going from rostral to caudal, and making coronal sections. Those are the brain areas 
that are currently thought to be involved in mediating motivated behavior, drug dependence, and dependence syndrome on dependence syndromes where dependence is not directed, uh, directed towards a drug, but a non-drug stimulus like love or other stimuli. Olfactory bulb, prefrontal cortex, more, more precisely the medial prefrontal cortex, the insula, the accumbens, the caudate putamen, also called the dorsal stratum, as opposed to the ventral stratum that the accumbens represents, the septum, the bad nucleus of the stria terminalis, globus pallidus, hypothalamus, amygdala, habenula, hippocampus, thalamus, Subthal I'm sorry, subthalamic regions, the substantia nigra involved in uh, Parkinson's disease, the ventral tegmental area, the roughest region, the locus ceruleus mediating opiate withdrawal, for example, and the pons. So you see a, a very large number of brain regions actually constitutes the reward pathway. And what you can also see here is those are the connections between the brain regions. You see that they're interconnected to a very large degree. They're densely interconnected. And the thicker the connecting, the connecting semicircle is, the larger its chemical diversity. So it's not only one neurotransmitter that is involved in mediating motivated behavior or dependence, but it's a number of neurotransmitters contributing. Let's go back again to the clinical nomenclature so that you get a first footing of what the terms means. What the terms mean. Uh, here we have addiction. Addiction is an old term that uh, still is around, but should not be used anymore. In the DSM-4, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fourth revision issued by the American Psychiatric Association, uh, there are two forms, intensities of the disease progression differentiated. You have substance abuse as a less severe form which is differentiated from substance dependence, which is a more severe form of the dependence syndrome. In the DSM-5, those two categories have been combined, have been combined to one term, to one diagnosis, substance use disorder. ICD-10, I told you, issued by the World Health Organization, WHO, in its 10th revision, still differentiates harmful use from the dependent syndrome, which we have talked about, which I have described to you, and which I'm briefly repeating, re recapitulating again. A strong desire, difficulties in controlling, withdrawal, tolerance. For me, the core criterion, progressive neglect of alternative pleasures or interests, and persisting with substance use despite clear evidence of overtly harmful consequences. Again, three of these six criteria must be fulfilled when observing the period of the past year, of the past 12 months. Here is an illustration of what this can mean with respect to escalation of drug intake. And again, I'm referring to the landmark study by Wickler, Abraham Wickler, 1952, which has been cited in a recent review of us. And on the x-axis, you see the time, starting with 17th of October, 1947, and ending here um, on February 1st, 1948. And a subject that had been detoxified was allowed under controlled condition to re-experience or become re-addicted to morphine. He was allowed to uh, self-administer morphine or have intravenous morphine administered by a nurse whenever he wished to do so. And on the y-axis, you have two of them. You see the total daily morphine consumption. Here's the maximum of 
1380 milligram per day, so that's one gram per day of morphine. And on the y-axis, you see the distribution of the individual injections from zero to 2400 hours. And what you can see is over those two and a half months, he escalated his intake from uh, 30 milligram per kilogram a day to 1380 milligram per day. This is a 46 fold escalation of morphine use. So this is a illustration, an illustration what escalating drug use and drug dependence means. How do we operationalize aspects of addictive behavior, aspects of motivated behavior? How do we do this in the lab? And I would like to introduce you to a few basic science terms. Reward, as we talked about, would be the goal of motivated behavior. Reinforcement, a more strict definition. Uh, and we can differentiate positive and negative reinforcement. A reinforce is a stimulus that increases the frequency of the behavior leading to its presentation, or in more lay terms, any stimulus that you work for. If it's a positive a reinforcer, you work to obtain this reinforcer. If it's a negative reinforcer, you work to avoid it. Failing an exam would be negative reinforce and studying for the exam would be the behavior that you exert to avoid that negative reinforce. So this is an important construct when describing addictive behavior or drug dependent behavior because withdrawal is a negative reinforcer that heavily drives uh, behavior directed toward obtaining the drug. The termination of avoidance of withdrawal is an important factor in, for maintaining um, drug dependent behavior. There are different ways we can test that self-administration would be one of a very heavily used paradigm. It's based on concepts of operant or instrumental conditioning, sometimes also called Skinnerian conditioning. Condition place preference, or a runway, but in especially condition place preference, is a very frequently used experimental paradigm to study the effect that drug-associated cues have uh, obtained, the control that drug-associated cues have obtained uh, over the behavior of the animal. So if you're in a context that has been paired with experience a drug effect, that environment, which may be of no interest of you before being paired with the experience of the drug, becomes very important for you. You seek it out. It controls your behavior. And condition place preference um, measures the uh, respondent conditioning, also called Pavlovian conditioning. Drug discrimination is also an experimental paradigm that I will not go into. This is a summary of the different factors that contribute what we see as drug reinforcement. If we work for something, if we work for a drug, um, we, can, we can tease apart this working for a drug the intensity at which we work for the drug to obtain the drug into those different factors. And there are two major contributors, the incentive value of the drug, how much it is worth or interesting uh, for us, and the incentive salience of condition stimuli. Uh, so how important uh, are drug-associated stimuli that per se are of no importance to us before being paired with a drug in controlling our behavior. Two terms, drug liking and within quotation marks, non-conscious liking, sometimes called subconscious liking, sometimes called unconscious liking, liking that we are not aware of but that drives our behavior. Um, 
is tapping into that part of all the factors and the wanting or the non-conscious wanting, a wanting that we are not aware of but still determines our behavior, taps more into the incentive salience of conditioned stimuli. And the two major paradigms, experimental paradigms, are lever press based operant conditioning paradigms. And here you can see the so-called Skinner boxes named after Boris Frederick Skinner, famous operant conditioner. And condition place preference more taps into those, into that factor incentive salience of drug associated conditioned stimuli. This would be an example of a condition place preference box. It's a three, in this case, it's a three compartment uh, experimental apparatus or a CPP box as we call it. And you see there are two different contexts. Here you have a um, vertically striped wallpaper and holes in the floor. Here you have horizontally striped wallpaper and you have slits in the floor. And per se and initially the individuals tested there, we test rodents, rats and mice, show no preference or slight preference for one or over the other compartment. And then we pair one compartment, say with cocaine, and the other compartment, say with saline injections. And then they acquire incentive salience. They become important because they have been associated with cocaine in this case, and with nothing, just the vehicle sale in this case. And the animals in a drug, when tested in a drug-free state, the doors are removed then, and the animals are given free choice to explore and enter each chamber, S simply spend more time in that compartment. And this is direct measure of, uh, of the rewarding strength or the reward or the more precisely incentive salience, the importance that the drug associated con uh, sorry, uh, contextual stimuli have acquired over the behavior of the animal. This would be another version where the animal runs to obtain a reward at the end. This would be the rat's perspective. Uh, this would be the rat's perspective. You see a sliding door that opens a light at the end of the tunnel in an area where the animal obtains a stimulus, be that condensed sweetened milk or uh, cocaine or food or water. And uh, the faster it then runs to get there to obtain the reward, the more rewarding the stimulus is considered to be. Another way to operationalize goal-directed, motivated behavior for a stimulus. I would like to conclude with an overview, a very broad and brief overview over the current research and the open questions that uh, we think would be very important to have answered. So the questions are, which neural system or systems in which brain regions mediate which aspects of approach, appetitive, preparatory, operant, instrumental behavior as opposed to versus consummatory behavior. Both, both phases of the addictive, of the, of the addictive process, of the addiction process, of the dependence syndrome process uh, can be targeted. So we can, we can decrease the uh, rewarding properties of stimuli, we, we can decrease uh, dependent behavior by um, decreasing the intensity of this approach, appetitive, preparatory, operant, instrumental behavior, decrease craving that is consciously experienced or drives our behavior without rising to our consciousness, and we can influence that uh, pathological behavior by decreasing the uh, rewarding strength intensity of um, the stimulus for us. We can decrease the attractiveness, for example, of the drug effect to help the uh, substance-dependent person 
get away from the drug of abuse or non-drug stimulus. Uh, it is also important to investigate uh, these processes at a high temporal resolution. You can imagine if you, if you think back on your last experience of passionate love, how quickly those internal states, those emotions, the, the needs that drive you uh, may change. So we need uh, a high temporal resolution to address and answer the questions. Uh, just a very brief glimpse into that. It was found out that uh, different neural neuronal populations in the accumbens mediated and responded differently uh, before a, a, a liver press, for example, liver press response for cocaine versus water was obtained. So the nucleus accumbens, again, is not a homogeneous structure but consists of a number of different neuronal populations, neuronal ensembles, that have different functions during different phases of the preparatory, the anticipatory phase of uh, dependent behavior and the consummatory phase. And this is um, exemplified here. Again, just to give you a short glimpse of what's going on at the moment, uh, this is the summary slide, the schematic diagram of an optogenetic study by Lemlin and co-workers in which uh, the authors differentiated brain regions mediated aver mediating aversion uh, from those mediating reward. Aversion means literally turning my back towards. So it's one form of expression of motivated behavior, going away from that. The other one is approaching it, turning towards it, working to obtain that stimulus, that reward. And these researchers used uh, transgenic mice expressing channel rhodopsin, a structure that allows direct activation by light of neurons expressing the channel rhodopsin either in the LDT, which, uh, let's, uh, let us I'm sorry, let us remind ourselves, is the lateral dorsal tegmentum, mediating reward, and as opposed to the lateral habenula, mediating aversion. So when these researchers activated neurons in the LDT, uh, they showed a conditioned place preference for the compartment that was associated with photostimulation of the LDT neurons projecting into the VTA. VTA, we know, a hotspot for motivated behavior. In contrast, animals that had their lateral habenula neurons photoactivated showed an avoidance. You can see here that it's darker here, so the animals spend more time in the other conditioning compartment and less time in this compartment. So this is one very, very elegant way to show that different brain areas mediate different aspects of motivated behavior, reward versus aversion, or seeking out versus turning away and fleeing that stimulus. This is another example of the exciting novel uh, experimental tools that can be used to uh, investigate the contribution of different neuronal populations to different aspects of behavior. And Calibari and co-workers used dreads or designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs to investigate which aspects of condition place preference for stimuli uh, is mediated by dopamine D1 receptor expressing medium spiny neurons. First, these researchers showed that D1 medium spiny neuron activity increases in cocaine uh, condition place preference. And you see, similar to what we showed using a different and less sophisticated approach, that the time in the cocaine paired chamber is correlated um, with the activity of D1 medium spiny neurons 
and not correlated with the activation of the two medium spiny neurons, but rather by an inhibition. By using a transgenically imported uh, calcium indicator, and Calipari and co-workers also show that inhibition of the one medium spiny neurons by a ligand selective for dreads prevents cocaine condition place preference. So the conclusion was that um, in order to form the association between the stimulus of interest and the context in which it was presented, uh, activity of D1 medium spiny neurons in the accumbens is necessary. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, please send me an email at gerald.zernig at i-med-ac-at. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.